missing that. And now let me, I need to hit broadcast. Right, right, right. Oh, now it's not broadcasting. Oh, here we go. It wasn't live. Now it's live. Now it's live because we, we just, the attendees now are starting. Okay. That was like, we've no attendees. But hi, everybody. That was they, is it broadcasting now? I clicked, the, I clicked the button, Elaine. I'm not sure it's right recording. now. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I don't it's, recording. it's recording. Hi, everyone. It's just, it's recording. It's, I know Trust it's recording. Oh, there we go. I see it. Okay. Great. Okay. Hi, everybody. Some little production challenges tonight. <laughs> Never a dull moment at the E3 Summit. So welcome. We'll give you a couple of minutes to get on since we're situated finally. And then we'll, then we'll talk. I see Dr. Romano's on. Hi, Dr. Romano. Okay, now we're gonna call. Now we're gonna call people out. I know. It's a good thing we got this going because Kelly's no IT person is checking on us to make sure. So, Eileen, you're coming in and out a little bit, just so you know. Sorry, guys, we're just as we go through it. It could be my internet. Yeah, I think it's good. So we're gonna give it a couple of minutes, everybody, um, and let some more people come on. Eileen. Question, this Ron. Are you already sharing screen? Excuse me? Are you already sharing screen? Is this what it's gonna look like when we start? Yeah, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna we're gonna have my PowerPoints on first and then when we talk to, when you then um we're gonna go to Marcella's video and then we then you guys will do your PowerPoint. Okay. I just wanna make sure that I can see what I need to see when it's time. Yeah. <laughs> that would be a good thing. And then I'll be asking the questions after. So you don't have to worry about those. So we see people coming in. We'll give them another minute. It's practically a holiday weekend here. So hey everyone, you know, I'll be in the um, chat. I'm Helene. I'm Eileen will introduce me, but let us know where you're from. So in the chat, let us know where you're from. And uh, I'm from New York City, so I'll put that in the chat right now. We'll just give it a couple minutes. And, uh, and then we'll get started. And the people who are late will be able to watch this at the beginning in the, in the recording, which will be up tomorrow. How long will it be up, Eileen? It will be up for a while. It's, we're gonna keep it in the app for a while, uh, at least, at least uh, two months. And then we'll see what happens after that, where we put it after that. But yeah, it's going to be in the app. So I think we should start. And as people, I'm sure more people will join as we are, um, as we move along here. Um, so in the formal part of our presentation. So my name is Eileen Michelli, and I am the Chief Program Officer for the Mark Ann Foundation. Um, I also want to introduce you to my colleague, Helene Baruch, who just said hi. Um, and she's going to be in the chat box. And what she'll do is she'll be posting um, links that are relevant to um, the presentation tonight. So you'll be able to find a lot more materials that um, complement what Dr. Um, Lacto and Dr. Young are presenting. <clears throat> so on behalf of, um, welcome to week two of the International E3 Summit, Educating, Empowering, and Enriching Our Community, brought to you by the Mark Ann Foundation and its divisions, the Louis Dietz Syndrome Foundation and the VEDS Movement, and our partners in Europe at BESERN. This, this is like the best slide of my part. So um, this, we're really making history. Um, we're making history. Uh, we are up to 2,747 registrants from 72 countries. Many of them I had to look up to put on this map. Um, you guys are from all over the world and it's really, incre it's really incredible that we're able to um, get this great information out to you no matter where, that, where you live. The other thing that's really um, incredible is that we have such a great mix of people who have Marfan syndrome, Lois Deed syndrome, VEDS, Stickler, and other conditions like um, EDS, Beals, aortic aneurysm. Um, what's also really gratifying is that um, like almost 350 medical professionals are part of this summit as well, um, getting, also trying to get the best information from the presenters that we have. So um, that's really um, that's really a testament to the speakers that we have and you know their generosity of sharing their time and their expertise for everybody. 
Um, I, want to I want to recognize our presenting sponsors, Brigham and Women's Hospital and American Communications Construction. Uh, because of them and our other sponsors, we can bring you this summit um, free of charge. So that's really great that we have people like that. Um, before we start, a couple more things. Um, I want to share that this summit is a forum to provide open discussion of issues related to genetic aortic and vascular conditions. Opinions stated in each of the talks are those of the speakers and not necessarily those of the Marfan Foundation and Vesern. Um, if questions arise or you need clarifications about differences in opinions um, between session speakers, please contact us at marfan.org slash e3ask. And finally, my last slide here is um, just ask me for your feedback. So after this presentation, um, stay in the app and you see where the three stars are that say rate you want to click on that and we'll be able to get some, there are some few questions in there for you and we'd love to get your feedback um, on what was presented here and this, and this talk because what we're doing is trying to get you what you need. So um, please give us that if you could. Um, so before we go into the, um, the, the first presentation, I just wanted to um, welcome Dr. Lacro and Dr. Young and um, you want to just say hello and a couple of words to start before we get going. Luke? Great, thank you. Thank you, Eileen. Uh, thank you for that wonderful welcome. And we're so excited to see all these registrants and uh, people that are that are uh, globally participating and connecting over this conference. This is um, amazing. Um, I'm very excited to be here. Thank you so much for inviting me to participate. And um, I'm excited to, to go ahead and present. So thank we're you. <laughs> we're lucky to have you. Ron? Hi, everybody. I'm calling from Boston, uh, so we're covering both coasts. And I, I like Dr. Young, I'm very pleased to be here with you tonight. At least it's night here. Great. Thank you so much. So um, first, what we're going to do, we have Marcella Nunez-Smith with us. And um, she. we're going to get a short little um, video from her, um, giving her personal perspective. She has a child with Marfan, who you will get to meet in a second. <laughs> Ria's Marfan diagnosis came as a great surprise to us. Rhea is now seven, but when she was four, we noticed that she was having a hard time seeing and she would get very close to objects and go very close to the TV. And we took her to the ophthalmologist and quite frankly thought that she probably just needed glasses. And in that January, we found out that she had sublux lenses and the ophthalmologist who was great really astutely said, I think she has Marfan syndrome, and referred us off to a top doctor to address it. And when we got to Boston Children's, uh, the eye doctor said, I want you to see Dr. Lacro in cardiology, just to be sure. And so by April, we had her first echocardiogram, and she had a genetic analysis, and the Marfan diagnosis was confirmed. It was a lot, and sometimes it feels like a blur. Everything that happened, it all happened so quickly. We really thought she just needed glasses. But we've been so very fortunate and grateful to have an extraordinary team of providers, especially Dr. Lacro. <laughs> he sees Rio regularly. She has her regular checkups, including her annual echocardiogram. And she takes her Lersartan every night, like a really good girl to protect her heart. It's been wonderful to just have these trusted physicians in our lives. It's all okay. Rhea goes to school. She has a great time playing with her friends. We're happy. So my advice to all the parents out there who are learning about a Marfan diagnosis, perhaps for the first time, really wondering what it means, say it is gonna be okay and make sure sure you listen to your doctors. They'll give you the great right advice for what's safe for your child. Trust them, trust that advice. And remember at the end of the day, these are our kids and they're fantastic. I'm happy to answer any questions about life with Marfan. Wait. <laughs> So that was great. <laughs> Marcella, do you just want to say hi? Marcella's going to be with us after the presentation, and so she'll be able to give her perspective too. Do you want to say hello, Marcella? Oh, yes. It's, um, it's great to be here, and thank you so uh, much, Eileen, for inviting me to be, be part of this panel. 
Um, and uh, it was really nice to see Rhea up there on screen too. <laughs> well, we're so glad to have you. So now what we're going to do is we're going to have, um, I'm going to shut my video off. Marcella will shut her video off. Video off, And what we will do is have um, Dr. Lacro and um, Dr. Young will present um, this, uh, this great information to us tonight. Are you pulling that up, um, Luch? I have it pulled up on my screen, but I don't have a share. Someone else has pulled it up. Okay, so um, Ron, do you want to pull up pull it up on your side? I don't know if I've lost my connection here or what's going on. There it is. Can everybody see the screen? Not yet, Ron. Mm. Um, I can pull it. I can pull it up if you want. You have to tell me to, to switch the slides. Yeah. Why don't you go ahead and pull it up then? Okay. Sorry, everybody. Okay, I'm, I'm going to give me two seconds and we will be there. A minute. Now do you see it? Yeah. Okay, great. Just tell me when to switch slides. Okay, hello everyone. Dr. Young and I are very pleased again to spend time with you today to discuss children's heart issues in connective tissue conditions. Next slide. In terms of, um, again, next slide. In terms of learning objectives for this session, we're gonna begin with a brief introduction to marfan lewis dietz syndromes. We'll describe basic normal cardiovascular anatomy and present the most common findings that affect the heart and blood vessels in people with connective tissue conditions. We will review the various imaging techniques that we commonly use to visualize the heart and blood vessels and review the concept of Z-scores, which are very useful in evaluating the size of the aorta, particularly in growing children. We will discuss medical and surgical management for Marfan and Lewis D syndromes. Finally, we'll present some information about choosing appropriate physical activity and exercise for children and teenagers with connective tissue conditions, and then open up for your questions. Next slide. Marfan syndrome was first described by a French pediatrician, Antoine Marfan, in 1896, when he wrote about a five-year-old girl named Gabrielle, who had the typical skeletal features we now associate with Marfan syndrome, including the long and thin arms and legs. Next slide. And almost 20 years later, ectopia lentis, or dislocation of the lens, was described together with the skeletal features. And in this photograph, you can see the edge of the lens in the middle of the eye. So instead of being centered behind the pupil, the lens has been displaced or dislocated away from the middle of the eye. Next slide. Then in the 1940s, there were case reports of aortic aneurysms, aortic directions, or tears in the aorta in association with the lens dislocation and skeletal features. And in these pictures here by ultrasound, CT, and MRI, you can appreciate the aortic root, which is the very beginning of the aorta, is markedly enlarged. Next slide. In the middle picture, you see a large aortic aneurysm at the time of surgery. And aortic dissection is the most serious complication associated with aortic aneurysms. On the drawing on the left, you can see that a dissection can start when the inner layer of the aorta separates from the middle and outer layers of the aorta, and this can cause chest pain. If the tear progresses, it can be life-threatening or fatal. And the major goal of the treatment and follow-up of children and adults with connective tissue conditions is to prevent an aortic dissection. Next slide. So here we show the classic triad of Marfan syndrome, the dislocated lens, the skeletal findings, and the enlarged aorta. No other syndrome has this unique combination of findings, 
And we now know that the syndrome is caused by changes in the FBN1 gene, which encodes the connective tissue protein fibrillin-1. Next slide. In 2005, Bart Lloyds and Dr. Hal Dietz identified several children who had overlapping features with Marfan syndrome, they had characteristic fe uh, facial features with a broadened forehead, somewhat uh, widely spaced eyes, and a smallish chin. Um, what they had was some more aggressive and diffuse vascular disease. Um, in Lloyds Dietz, the vascular involvement is more aggressive and involves the entire arterial tree. The dissections often occur at an earlier age in a smaller diameter than occurs in Marfan syndrome. In addition, there's a general, generalized arterial tortuosity, especially of the head and neck vessels, and congenital heart abnormalities are common, including a patent ductus arteriosus, bicuspid aortic valve, and atrial septal defect, amongst others. Next slide. Here are some examples of the diffuse arterial tortuosity. In the slide on the left, uh, the first arrow, you can see that there is aortic uh, dilation. When we move to the um, head and neck vessels, we can see a corkscrew-like appearance of tortuous vessels coming off the aorta. And as we move further down the aorta, you can see that the aorta takes a 90-degree angle as it goes down into the abdomen. In the middle frame, we see again a corkscrew-like appearance of the head and neck vessels arising from the transverse aortic arch. And then the aorta itself folds over on itself like almost like a hairpin, and likewise in the frame on the right. Next slide, please. Some additional features that we see with Lloyd's deep syndrome are a cleft palate or a hole in the roof of the mouth, a bifid uvula. The uvula is the appendage that sticks down from the throat in the back or in the back of the mouth. Typically, it is single, and in this case, it has um, a little dent or a rivet within it. Um, craniosynostosis may be associated. That's uh, where there's fusion of the skull plates, as you can see across the midline in this um, three-dimensional CT scan. And structural brain and spinal abnormalities are common as well. Next slide. Lloyd's Dietz syndrome has been identified um, to occur because of mutations in the following genes. TGF-beta R1, 2, TGF-beta 2, 3, SMAD3 and SMAD2. Next slide. So what do Marfan syndrome and Lloyd's Dietz have in common? Well, both involve a single gene that affects many phenotypic characteristics of the syndrome. There's significant phenotypic variation amongst affected individuals. There's high penetrance, meaning that there's a high proportion of affected individuals carrying the gene variant that express similar traits and both demonstrate progression of findings over time. The key, however, is that early diagnosis of each prevents per, uh, the adverse outcomes in the end. Next slide. Perhaps one of the most well-known individuals with Marfan in our era was Jonathan Larson, a renowned American composer who died the day before the opening of his musical Rent in 1996 of an aortic dissection. Sadly, this occurred after two days of chest pain and two visits to a New York City emergency room. Again, highlighting that early diagnosis allows for prevention. Next slide. So now we're gonna review some basic cardi cardiac anatomy in the normal heart. And in this cartoon, you can see that there are two sides of the heart. In blue, the right side of the heart pumps to the lungs. And in red, the left side of the heart pumps blood to the body through the aorta. On each side of the heart is an upper chamber, which is the atrium, and the lower chamber, which is the ventricle, which is the pumping chamber of the heart. There are four valves in the heart, two on each side, and the function of these valves is to keep the blood moving in one direction in the direction of the arrows on the diagram, from the right atrium to the right ventricle to the lungs, and then on the left side from the left atrium to the left ventricle to the body. The most important heart problems that affect children with connective tissue conditions usually affect the left side of the heart, which is the side that pumps the body and is usually under higher pressure and is working harder than the right side. And that's normal. The valves on the left side of the heart are the mitral valve and the aortic valve, and these are the valves that are most commonly affected in connective tissue conditions. The most next slide. 
The most important life-threatening condition in Marfan or Lois Deeds syndrome is an enlargement of the aorta, which is the body's biggest artery, supplying all of the body. And most commonly, the aortic root, which is the very first part of the aorta just above the heart, becomes enlarged. The size of the aortic root can vary from normal to mildly enlarged or severely enlarged. And in this, in this diagram, you can see the normal heart on the left with a normal size aorta, and on the right, a heart with an enlarged aorta or an aneurysm. Next slide. The most common cardiovascular findings include, uh, sorry, I lost my place. The most common cardiovascular findings in, include progressive enlargement of the aorta. When the aorta is very large, we call it an aneurysm. And the risk for a tear or dissection of the aorta increases as the aorta gets bigger. With smaller aortas, the risk of dissection is low. And with large aortas, the risk is high. Fortunately, dissection is rare in children. Enlargement of the aorta can also cause leaking of the aortic valve. And regurgitation is just the medical term for a leaky valve signifying that blood is going backward rather than, rather than forward. Other common cardiovascular findings include mitral valve prolapse, where the valve tissue becomes stretchy and causes the valve to leak. The heart chambers can enlarge and the squeezing function of the heart can weaken. Dr. Young has already showed you pictures of arterial tortuosity. Um, and this is, can be seen in both syndromes, Marfan and Lois Dietz, but is more common and more pronounced in Lois Dietz. And finally, although aneurysms close to the heart are most common, there can be enlargement and dissection or tears in other blood vessels all over the body, as well as birth defects of the heart, things like misshapen valves or holes in the heart. And these, again, are more common in Lois Dietz as compared to Marfan. Next slide. I think you can keep advancing. Oh. There we go. Okay, so on this slide, we summarize the different techniques we use to take pictures of the heart and blood vessels and to make the necessary measurements we need to decide how to, to treat a person. Echocardiography is an ultrasound based technique that offers very good visualization of the heart, the aortic root, and larger blood vessels close to the heart. The quality of the pictures depends on the person's age, body size, shape of the chest, and patient movement. Echo is widely available easy to perform, and well tolerated by most. And it's usually the best for initial diagnosis and long-term follow-up over the lifespan. Most of the time, echo can be done without sedation. PT or computerized tomography is an x-ray-based technique that gives excellent visualization of all of the blood vessels, both close to the heart as well as away from the heart. It's widely available, quick, and well tolerated, and can often be used in infants and children without sedation because it is so quick. Although it is an x-ray technique, the amount of radiation exposure now with the modern sc scanners is quite low, and so it can be a safe um, technique. This is the best test when the, there is a concern for dissection, for example, when a patient presents to the emergency room with chest pain. And then finally, MRI or magnetic resonance imaging uses a magnet to image different kinds of tissues, again, showing excellent visualization of the heart and all of the blood vessels and can also show dissection. This technique is a little bit less available, especially in an emergency, takes longer than CT, but does not involve x-ray or radiation. MRI is best for long-term follow-up, especially when multiple studies need to be done over time and can be useful when echo or ultrasound cannot provide all the imaging that we need. MRI for infants and young children generally requires sedation or general anesthesia. Next slide. In practice, we usually use a combination of these imaging modalities over the lifespan, and it is important that measurements be made in a consistent fashion, preferably at a single center with lots of experience in connective tissue conditions. The measurements need to be compared directly to prior studies and trends need to be followed over time. In adults and older teenagers, medical and surgical decisions are generally made on the, based on the absolute measurements, which is usually given in centimeters or millimeters. In growing children, there are limitations in using absolute dimension because the normal size of the aorta will depend on the size of the child. So in order to answer the question, what should the aortic size be for any given body size or any given child, 
we introduced the concept of a z-score or a z-score in, in Canada and other countries. And for those of you familiar with the concept of standard deviations, the z-score is based on the number of standard deviations above or below the mean. But if you're not familiar with the idea of standard deviation, that's okay too. You can think of the z-score as a severity score indicating how big a measurement is relative to the normal range. Next slide. So here's a graph depicting the normal range of aortic size for any given body size. Essentially, this is a growth chart for the aortic root. And in the y-axis going up and down is the size of the aortic root in centimeters. In the x-axis going from left to right is the size of the patient given in body surface area, which can be calculated using your height and weight. So little babies would be far up to, the, up to the left and large adults would be far to the right and everybody else would be in between based on their size. The average measurement is given by the thicker line in the middle, which is marked mean for average. And the so-called normal range is defined by the top and bottom lines. And most people in the general population will have an aortic measurement between those two skin lines, which is defined by two standard deviations. So the z-score tells you how far away from average your measurement is. If your aortic root is average, the z-score is zero. If your aortic root is at the high end of normal, your z-score is plus two. And if your aortic root is very large, it might, be, it might have a z-score of five or six or seven. On this graph, you can see the actual aortic root measurements for one of my patients with Marfan syndrome from when he was age four through his 20s. And you can see that all of the measurements are above the normal range, but not very far from average. So the z-scores are all between plus two and plus three. One thing you should note is that the aortic root in this person started out in the mild range and grew throughout childhood in proportion to the rest of the body and stayed mild throughout his adolescence. And the aorta stopped growing at around four centimeters. During adulthood, the aorta can begin to expand again, and this would not be normal growth. And if the aortic root ever exceeded five centimeters, we would recommend surgery. Next slide. And then this is the same patient showing that the z-score from age four through his 20s stayed between plus two and plus three. If the z-score stays the same, that means the aorta is growing in proportion to the rest of the body, whereas if the z-score goes up, the aorta is growing faster than the rest of the body. So we would prefer that the z-score either stays the same or goes down. Next slide. Just some general thoughts about z-scores. Very high z-scores are very uncommon. So z-scores greater than seven or eight or 10 are very uncommon, signifying a very large aorta. In growing children, even if the z-score stays the same, the aorta is growing or getting bigger along with the child. And for most, most children with Marfan syndrome and Lois Dietz, um, the aortic root z-score either stays about the same or slowly increases over time. Next slide. So now we'd like to go ahead and switch gears to management options, which are directed towards improving long-term outcomes. These include medical management, um, which includes beta blockers and angiotensin II receptor blockers. We'll get a little bit more into detail of how both of these medications work in some later slides, as well as exercise restriction, surgical intervention when the aorta gets large enough or if there are associated findings that require repair, and uh, lastly, any supportive services. Next slide. So the um, medical management uh, primarily involves two types of medications. The first is beta blockers. You'll see that this group of medications ends uh, by, with uh, OLOL, propanolol, atenolol, metoprolol are common uh, medications in this family. These medications block the effects of adrenaline or epinephrine, and in doing so, decrease the sheer stress on the walls of the aorta they lower heart rate and blood pressure. Next, angiotensin II receptors and then Sartan. So will Sartan, Herbisartan are common medications in this group. These block the action of angiotensin II and relax the blood pressures and lower, uh, the blood vessels, excuse me, and lower blood, and lower blood pressure. You'll note that the beta blockers also have an effect on heart rate where the angiotensin receptor blockers do not. Oftentimes, we're asked which medication is better. Next slide. 
So in an attempt to answer this question, the Pediatric Heart Network sponsored the, heart, the Marfan trial. This was the largest pediatric trial to date assessing the effects of atenolol versus losartan in children and young adults with Marfan syndrome. Over 600 individuals with Marfan syndrome ranging from six months to 18 years of age were enrolled in this trial. Um, all subjects had an aortic root Z score greater than three, so already had a dilated aortic root. The um, subjects were enrolled and randomized to treatment with either atenolol or losartan and were followed for a three year period of time. Next slide, please. So in the upper left graph, we have a max, we have a maximum aortic root dimension noted on the Y line. And on the X um, line, we have time post um, randomization into each arm of therapy. You'll note that there was really no significant difference noted in the growth of the aortic root in at root dimensions with either medication. In the lower right graph, we have on the Y axis, maximum aortic root Z score, and on the X axis, time post randomization or enrollment into the study. You'll see also here that there was no significant change in maximum aortic root Z score decrease in either atenolol or losartan groups. Next slide. A further analysis was done of the subgroups that were enrolled, and there was no difference found between adults and children, between those who had larger aortas, so Z scores greater than 4.5, past use of beta blockers, or between females and males. Next slide. The trial did find that the annual rate of decrease in aortic root Z score was more significant in the younger children, and this was true for both atenolol and losartan. Next slide, please. Adverse outcomes, which included dissection, surgery, or death, were low and were similar for both arms of the study. So the conclusions of the Marfan trial, next slide, were that there was no significant difference in the rate of aortic dilation between atenolol and losartan over three years. Next, that the treatment effect did not differ according to pre-specified subgroups. Both drugs were well tolerated by everyone that was involved, and losartan and atenolol may be more effective reducing aortic root growth, or Z-score, in young subjects. Next slide. So in addition to the Pediatric Heart Network trial, there were a number of different trials around the world. Um, and some of the other trials asked uh, different questions. And the researchers asked, some of the trials, the researchers tried to ask the question, does combination therapy, does Lozartan and a beta blocker work better than beta blocker by itself? And the results of these trials were mixed, were not consistent, meaning that some of the trials showed that combination therapy was better than single drug therapy, while some of the other trials did not show a benefit of having two drugs instead of one. Next slide. And then the most recent trial from the United Kingdom asked another question, whether a different sartan, herbisartan, um, which is like losartan but different, and the, this trial asked the, whether erisartan added to a beta blocker was better than beta blocker alone. And that trial showed that the combination or addition of erisartan was um, uh, helpful. Um, so while losartan is more commonly used now, erisartan is another choice of therapy and may be used more frequently in the future. Some of you may be already on erisartan. And finally, we are trying to put all the trial data together to see if we can learn more from combining the results from the eight or 10 trials that happen around the world. Next slide. I should mention that similar large scale trials for people with Lois Dietz syndrome have not been done um, and a number of reasons for that, but we generally use the same medications and the same principles when choosing a medical treatment for children with Lois Dietz syndrome. Um, here's a diagram that, no, go back, sorry. Here's a diagram that I put together a few years to give, just give a general approach for choosing medical therapy. In the middle, you can see once the aorta is dilated, say the Z-score is greater than two and a half or three, the aorta is definitely enlarged, then it's reasonable to give either a beta blocker or an angiotensin receptor blocker. 
Now, if the aorta is normal in size or only borderline enlarged, um, some people do treat with either beta blocker or angiotensin receptor blocker, but, but, <clears throat> but some, of, some clinicians, including myself, um, that might wait and watch the aorta closely and start medicine when the aorta dilates further. And then finally, on the right, um, if the aorta is severely dilated or if the Z-score is increasing over time, then we could consider combination therapy with two drugs instead of one. <clears throat> this is just one approach, and different clinicians do have slightly different approaches, so there's no exact one answer for every different patient, and ultimately the choice for treatment will depend on patient, family, and provider preference, tolerance for the medication, side effects, if any, family history, other characteristics such as age or coexisting conditions. <clears throat> Next slide. Now in 2018, the FDA issued a warning against the use of fluoroquinolones, which is a group of antibiotics um, in people with genetic aortic conditions. You can advance, uh, yeah. Um, so this is a family of antibiotics that um, rhymes with fluxacin. Um, these are um, relatively commonly prescribed um, and some studies show that people who took these antibiotics were more likely to experience an aortic aneurysm or dissection. So if possible, these should be avoided in people with genetic aortic conditions, unless there is no alternative for the infection in question. Next slide. And now just, uh, you can advance until all the lines show up, yeah. So some brief comments on surgical in intervention. Fortunately, surgery is much less common in children as compared to adults with Marfan and Lois Dietz syndrome. The exact timing of surgery really depends on a number of different factors, including the syndrome diagnosis, the specific gene involved, the specific gene mutation, the size of the aorta, and the rate of aortic growth. Ideally, aortic root replacement surgery should be done before a dissection starts, as the results and outcome are better if there is no prior dissection. In adults, the cutoffs are fairly standard. So aortic root surgery, for example, is recommended when the aorta is larger than five centimeters in people with Marfan syndrome and around 4.2 centimeters in people with Lois Dietz syndrome. For infants and children, the cutoffs are less clear. If there is a consistent increase in aortic root C-score, if there's rapid aortic growth of more than five or 10 millimeters in a single year, if there's progressive leaking of the aortic or mitral valves, these could be indication for surgery in children. If there's a family history of aortic dissection at less than five centimeters, or if the child has a lot of tortuosity, the risk is considered higher and, and could be indication for intervening sooner. Uh, but in practice, we consider all of these factors in deciding the optimal time for surgical intervention. Next slide. So next, I'd like to move to exercise uh, in terms of management of these conditions. And probably the most frequently asked questions are what type of exercise is safe? Not only that, but how much exercise is safe? And do we always have the right answer? Probably not. We typically err on the side of safety because we don't really have any outcomes data in this area to guide us. Next slide. We do know that, that routine exercise has, very, has multiple benefits. Um, those that are cardiovascular include lowering heart rate, lowering blood pressure, and cholesterol. There are also a blood sugar lowering and weight loss benefits. Um, in, in addition, there are mental health benefits, such as decreasing depression, less anxiety, improved mood, and improved memory. So we do know that there are benefits, but I guess the question becomes how much and what type. Next slide. So we do know that there are different physiologic responses to exercise. Not all physical activities are the same. For example, dynamic or isotonic exercise includes muscle shortening or lengthening during contraction, which results in muscle movement. In this case, blood vessels dilate, and this results in a moderate increase in mean blood pressure. On the other hand, static or isometric exercise, such as weightlifting, involves muscle contraction without movement. In this case, the blood vessels constrict to the non-contracting muscles, and there is increased blood flow to the contracting muscles, resulting in a significant increase in blood pressure, much more than seen in dynamic exercise. Next slide. 
There's also competitive versus recreational sports or exercise. Namely, in competitive sports, the goal is to undergo systematic training so that an individual can perform at their peak and push to their highest physical limit. Whereas in recreational sports, these tend to be non-competitive, they're aimed for fitness, for fun, and they usually include light to moderate exercise. Next slide. What we typically recommend is to approach exercise and physical activity in a safe and practical way. We recommend avoiding intense contact sports, those that involve bodily collision and weightlifting for the reason of, of significant increases in blood pressure. Typically, we'll recommend staying at an aerobic level of exercise where you can still talk and hold a conversation comfortably during the activity or using a perceived activity scale, as you'll see in this slide, typically we would recommend keeping activities somewhere between the two to six or the green and uh, blue bars. Next slide. One other important um, uh, uh, recommendation is to obtain and wear medical alert bracelets. These bracelets can, uh, should include information regarding diagnosis, risk for aortic dissection, they can include medical information about uh, medications that you're taking, allergies, and most importantly, emergency contact information. If someone gets in an accident, the first responders will see this. It does contain a lot of information that is key in improving outcomes, especially in situations where time is of the essence. Another uh, important resource is Backpack Health. And this is an app that can be loaded onto your phone. You can actually load medical records onto this app and they can be shared with whoever your, your providers are in the event that you're out of town, you don't, you, your doctor's office is closed or in an emergency. So it's a very nice feature to allow for medical information to be shared amongst providers. Next slide. So in summary, cardiovascular complications of Marfan's and Lloyd's Dietz syndromes can be life-threatening, and therefore early and accurate diagnosis is essential. Surveillance and management, as Ron had mentioned and as we went over in this talk, are needed to take into account children's growth. Um, they're very important in terms of um, guiding therapy, knowing when surgical intervention is necessary, and with regular surveillance, awareness, and appropriate medical therapy and surgical intervention when needed, long-term outcomes can save lives. Next slide, I believe uh, that's the end, and we, we thank you, and I believe we can take questions now. Okay, so now we have you on. Marcella, you can come back. We'd love to see you as well. Hi. So um, I just want to say that I mean I know we started a little bit late because of the little technology glitches. So I'm hoping that um, Doc, you can all stay a little bit longer and uh, answer. There's a lot of questions in here. Um, so let's just get let's let's as, as one of my favorite people says is let's get after it here. Um, so at what point, if any, should surgery be considered for young child with functioning valves, only mild linkage, linkage leakage? but a very dilated aortic sinus, like a Z-score of 10 or more. I think, Ron, you talked about that a bit in your um, presentation. Yeah, so I, I, again, a lot of factors go into it, whether the Z-score is changing, whether there's progressive leaking of the valve, um, you know, uh, depends also on the family history, um, or whether there's other things in the heart that need to be addressed, um, like, you know, if a aorta is enlarged and the mitral valve is also leaking, we we might intervene sooner. But there, you know, there it's possible that the z-score, if the z-score has been ten for a while, and and it, and the aorta is growing in proportion to the patient and not progressing, uh, and the aortic valve is functioning well, um, it would be reasonable to. Um, to continue to observe, but the, again, the higher a z-score. Uh, the higher the likelihood that intervention is going to be required at some point. Do you have anything to add, uh, Lucia? No, I agree with you on that. I think, you know, if, if it, at the z-score of eight, we start considering it, especially if there's been any changes in the rate of growth, if there's any associated findings, such as, as you had mentioned, um, valve weakness or the rate of increases changing. But I think that at a size of a z-score of 10, that's a pretty large aorta, so I'd be considering 
Um, great, thank you. Is there any, um, I guess we'll go back to Ron and then we'll go to Luch on this also. What's your opinion on Losartan versus Herbisartan? Hmm. Um, you know, <clears throat> I, I think that the answer is that we don't really know because we, no, no trial has compared Losartan against Herbisartan. Um, but they do are they are thought to act in the the in a similar way. They're they're in the same family of sartans. Um, from my standpoint, I think you know there's an advantage per, uh, perhaps that you can give more herbisartan. I think you can um, with the same safety and tolerance profile. Um, and if the limitations or if there are limitations to the effect based on dose, then in theory, giving an herbisartan. Um, might be better than Lozartan. I do have some patients where I've switched to uh, Lozartan from Lozartan to Herbisartan and it seems to work better. Um, but this, this was not a, a randomized trial. Okay, um, there's, a, there's a question here about what doctors should be doing um, with young children, but I just wanna ask Marcella to pull her in here. So in terms of Rhea, so um, she was diagnosed, then what kind of monitoring do you have? I bladed to the heart because that's what we're talking about here. Yeah, so we're very fortunate. We are patients of Dr. Lackrose. Uh, and so we have um, a, a routine of annual uh, appointments at this point. Um, and I think the cadence of the appointments is, is essentially determined by the results of the echocardiogram. Um, and so every year, it's, it's sort of on our calendar, the annual echo. Uh, and in between, actually, you know, she does take Losartan. Um, and she was started on that uh, very soon after her diagnosis. Um, but she's tolerated it extremely well. Uh, she actually, if she has a liquid formulation, she gives it to herself every evening um, in a syringe. And it's her purple medicine because it's grape flavored. She understands why she takes it. Dr. Lackrose explained it to her really clearly. Um, she knows it's important. But, you know, she, we haven't had any issues where we've needed to even sort of check her blood pressure or anything in between. She hasn't been symptomatic in that way. Um, so she sees her pediatrician who's here locally. We're in Connecticut um, regularly also. But, but for us, it really has come down to the annual echo, which is the ultrasound that the doctors talked about of her heart. Um, which she also knows is coming and tolerates it really well. They play cartoons for her. And so she knows that it's time to watch some TV too. So for the monitoring for us, um, it's, it's been annual exams. That's great. It was so great to see her smile in the, in the video. I was so glad she was there. Um, so Ron, but here's another child that um, a parent is asking about, um, a son who's one, year, who's one has LDS uh, SMAD3 mutation and wants to know what should his doctors be doing. I mean, one-year-old child with LDS SMAD3, mm. kind of like Rhea, or is it a little different? Well, I, you know, again, it's it's really going to depend on um, what the echo looks like. Um, uh, the most common finding would be an enlarged aorta, and the treatment. Um, you know, whether we use medicine, how often we see a patient, will depend on the the degree of enlargement uh, of the aorta. So it really, really really depends. Each, each patient's care is going to be tailored to the findings. Um, and most of that will be by echo. I, I think, you know, especially this is especially for people who are dealing with Mar a new diagnosis of Marfan syndrome. Often when we hear about the diagnosis, we hear the worst case scenario. We hear about the, the, the most um, devastating complications that could potentially um, happen. Um, but fortunately, and, and yes, some children definitely need surgery during childhood, but many of uh, many patients with connective conditions do very well through childhood and, and through adulthood. Um, and the life expectancy is close to essentially the same as the normal population. So although we talk about all the scary things, I think we should remember that that the most important thing is that we made the diagnosis and we were following that aorta and making careful decisions based on what that echo shows each time. I'm sure Marcella will have, might describe some anxiety right before the time of the echo. I, I know some patients who can, are fine for 11 months and three weeks. <laughs> the next visit That's is, funny. is a killer. Um, and it, but again, most of the time, 
uh, for many of the patients that I see, for many of the visits that I see, you know, things are not rapidly progressive. Um, and we, we use, I like to use the childhood years to educate, to teach about what the potential are, to even at uh, Rio's age, to, 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 to educate young children about the importance of the medicine and, and exercise and, and all of that stuff. I'm, I'm glad you said all that because the questions in here are like, are the extreme? Because of course, this is what parents are most worried about is having, you know, aortic surgery. So I'm going to ask these questions anyway, because I think it's an important message that to keep repeating. Um, so Luz, maybe you can take this one. Um, do children under the age of five, can they have valve sparing surgery? How common is that in, in children that young? Well, I, I, I'll go ahead and, and, and uh, echo what Ron had just mentioned. Um, I would say in, in the time that I've been seeing patients, I have not seen uh, any patient, any um, individuals under the age of five that had needed it. Now, uh, if we're talking about um, neonatal Marfan's, it may be a different uh, story because it's a more severe uh, presentation. However, in the typical uh, Marfan syndrome or Lloyd C syndrome, it's very rare to have surgery under the age, I would say probably in the preteen years or teenage years is usually when the aorta starts to grow at a more rapid uh, rate when individuals are going through puberty. Um, so that seems to be the time when we see the more rapid uh, changes, um, but usually not under the age of five. Thank you. Thank Ron, you. would you agree? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So, and, and we're fortunate that, that uh, again, and part of it, I think, is related to the relative size, right? So in adults, right. uh, you can get up to four or five, and certainly five or even much bigger than five centimeters, but it's very unusual to get a five centimeter aorta in a younger child. It's very unusual to get a big change of five uh, or 10 millimeters. Usually we're talking about a, a one millimeter change over a year or may, maybe even less. Um, so although we, we've talked about the worst case scenario today, um, the need for surgery in some cases, rapidly increasing Z-score, those scenarios are really quite uncommon. Um, not, it, it does, definitely does happen. And so I don't want to deny the reality of some of you right. who may have children that have already had surgery. Um, but for those of you um, who are new to the diagnosis, you know, um, recognize, you should recognize that the spectrum of, of severity is very wide. Um, and every, every child's story is different. Um, and so, you know, having a team, whether it's for your eye or your orthopedics or your cardiology, having a team that will follow you with it and that has experience with um, putting everything into context is very important. Oftentimes when I see a patient for the first time, you know, they, they don't even realize that perhaps their aorta is just mildly dilated. They've just, they've just heard the worst of the story. Yeah. Well, can, I, I, can I tap on, can I tap on something to that? Of course. Um, I want to ask that, you know, I know when, when you go to your doctor's appointments, you know, people are concerned about the Z-score and the size, um, but it's more the trend. So children, remember, children are growing. And so perhaps, the, and the aorta is growing too. So sometimes what we see, and Ron showed it quite nicely in the graph that he presented in, in the presentation, um, was that the Z-scores kind of sometimes go up and down and up and down because the aorta may grow a little bit and then the, the weight might increase or the height might increase as the child goes through a growth spurt. So it's really the trends that we're looking at in Z-score, uh, not so much the absolute value. Yeah, that's a great point. Thank you for adding that. Um, yeah. and that goes for medical therapy too. You know, the idea be behind these medicines, the idea behind why we guide um, children to certain kinds of exercise, for example, is really not because we think something very bad is going to happen if you pick up something heavy. It's really sort of the long-term effect, um, both good and bad, right? So the long-term effect of the medicine, taking it regularly, um, is, is where we see the benefit. And, and, and then the long-term effect of heavy weightlifting means that the aorta might be bigger than it would have been if if, if the child didn't participate in those activities. Exercise is really, really tough. Um, maybe less so for the younger child, but for teenagers, it can be a really tough conversation. And it's not one conversation, it's, it's activity. Um, exercise is a conversation that 
I try to address at every visit. Um, because it, we really, although, you know, there are things that we definitely recommend against, there, there are lots of uh, physical activity and exercise that is perfectly safe for people with Marfan syndrome. And there shouldn't be a blanket statement that, oh, kids just can't exercise. Absolutely not. Kids should exercise. And even um, uh, ki kids with connective tissue conditions should be able to exercise at some level. Well, I'm so glad you said that because I want to hear all about Rhea and what she does because she's just a kid. I mean, you, I mean, when I guess it's harder when they're diagnosed when they're teens. They've already done a lot of stuff, but she was diagnosed young. So tell us about her activity. Yeah, no, it's it's great, and this is I think a big question that we have as as parents. You, you know, even um, you know one of the things Dr. Lacro probably doesn't remember this, but in the even our first appointment, he really reassured us that you know the normal activities in PE for a child her age are like you know likely not representing any harm. You know, sort of worried that she's been in school already for years and what's happening in, in PE. And so she, you know, we we are able to have these conversations with her. She has a sister who's a competitive gymnast. Um, so we have competitive sport in our household. Uh, and, you know, there was a time when she just wanted to be like her big sister and wanted to start down that, that path. I think it's really helpful. We have the knowledge that, um, that we do now. You know, we take a lot of uh, nice long walks. Rhea swims. Um, she really enjoys that. Dr. Lacro knows that she also is doing some horseback riding um, mm -hmm. safely. <laughs> and so, you know, we have found a lot of other physical activities that she enjoys doing. Uh, and I think you know, that's the, the most important thing is that she doesn't fear uh, exercise and physical activity, but that she has that understanding that there's some things that aren't good for her. Her siblings know this, you know, that she's not supposed to pick them up. She's not supposed to give them piggybacks, right? So those are ways to kind of explain to her no weightlifting. And, um, you know, and she she gets it, her subs get it, her, her friends get it. Um, so, you know, it actually has ended up being, I don't know what's gonna happen when she gets older, but for now, uh, she understands it really well and, and it's, it's a non-issue for us. That's great, thank you, thank you so much. I was so glad that you were here to say that. So, um, but for those kids who do have, do need surgery, because I think we have several um, parents on who have kids with low ease deets that have had that issues. And there's a question here that um, my 13 year old with low ease deets too, has already had three aneurysms repaired. Is this a trend that we should expect many more aneurysms to appear in the future? Um, he's on the maximum dose for Lumsartan and Atenolol has been taking them since he was one. So because he's had so many already, is, is it a foreshadowing or what, is it a trend thing or what? They're thinking, they're thinking. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, unfortunately, you know, I think that once you have a serious um, aneurysm and multiple aneurysms, um, I think compared to people who have, haven't had a, a history of those kinds of aneurysms, um, I think the risk is higher for some reason, whether it's that specific gene mutation or that particular syndrome. And I, I think our response medically would be to try to use as much medicine as we can, realizing that, that even all the medicines that we have will not prevent all complications from happening. And, and then the other side of it is going to be um, imaging, you know, imaging more frequently when, um, just because um, the risk seems to be higher in your child. Um, so that's how I would respond to that situation. Okay, great, thank you. There are a couple of neonatal questions in here, but we're kind of running late. And I know there's another session on neonatal, so I'm just gonna hold off on those for now. So if you're waiting for those, I just wanna, I just apologize. Um, I also want to ask, ask um, okay, we talked a lot about Z-score. A lot of people put these questions in before the presentation and you, did, you all did such a great job talking about Z-score. So I'm also gonna skip, skip that for now. Those were answered. Um, here's a question though that we didn't talk about. Um, this parent is concerned about POTS in their daughter. However, the cardiologist thinks she's too young at the age of eight for this to be the problem. So first, you know, tell everybody what POTS is um, and then how common is it in young SMED three patients? So I'll, I'll start with the POTS. POTS is postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome. And it's typically something that, yes, we see more commonly in teenagers. Um, and it basically, you know, with changes in position, um, your heart rate will, will jump up, feel lightheaded. It's almost like a, a head rush. And some people 
um, have such a response that they actually can faint afterwards. Um, so, so it's something that we commonly do see. Um, I do think that if you're taking antihypertensives, which the medications that we manage the aorta with in connective tissue disorders can lower your blood pressure. They can also cause you to have symptoms, especially if you're dehydrated. Um, and so typically the way we would, rec you know, what we would recommend would be symptomatic treatment for POTS. And that symptomatic treatment is to increase fluid um, intake. Usually that means uh, 40 to 60 ounces per day, sometimes even more than that, to try and avoid caffeinated beverages because they have a diuretic effect. So they kind of contraindicate or, or negate the effects of increasing your fluid intake. Um, secondly, you can also um, uh, increase your salt intake, maybe one other option to try and hold on to fluid um, and increase uh, blood pressure or increase intravascular volume. Sometimes wearing compression stockings or hose if you're standing for a long period of time can also be helpful. Um, again, I, I have not had, it, had any patients with Lloyd's Beats that have had it at that young of an age, but if, you know, projecting what we would see in teenagers, I would suspect that it would be possible, especially if you're on antihypertensive medications and in times when you may be a bit dehydrated or um, not well tanked up. Ron, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, no, no, nothing much more to add other than, you know, POTS is basically an exaggerated response. To, you know, we all sort of feel dizzy when we're dehydrated or and your heart rate gets faster if you're dry or, or you know, sometimes you get a head rush when you get up too quickly. And POTS is basically when those symptoms occur, maybe at a time where you wouldn't expect them. Um, I have seen it in young children, maybe not so much in SMED. I can't say for sure for SMED 3, but some EDS patients can, can be affected. Um, I think the approach is the same as for other, for, for, for other situations where we see POTS. And physical exercise is part of that management. You know, I think, I think um, trying to avoid getting deconditioned and trying to have um, regular exercise can be part of minimizing the symptoms. Um, here's another question I want to ask, and I think this must be, um, it's such a challenge for parents because a lot of things happen when your child has Marfan and Lowy's seats and you don't know if it's part of the condition or they just have it. So this question, um, you know, is a Lowy's seats um, child, um, chest pain, headache, and dizziness occur together in young teenager, especially in hot weather, sometimes fainting. Is this common in the LDS, or how do you how do you look into it? Ron, do you want to go ahead with that one? Yeah. I mean, I, so the symptoms you said were headache, chest pain, headache, and dizziness occur together in young teenager, especially in hot weather, sometimes fainting. Yeah, so all of those symptoms are very. Uh, common in, in any teenager. Um, I think that um, my general approach, you know, for, you know, how much weight do you put on a symptom in, in somebody who has an important underlying condition like my family or low disease? Um, I, I think it, it has to depend on, you know, how severe the symptoms are. Um, I definitely would have a lower threshold for doing you know, specialized testing. Um, so any connective tissue c condition, you know, at least it should be running through my mind. Could this be a blood vessel problem? Could this be a cardiac problem? Um, but the symptoms that you're describing are so common in among teenagers that um, usually just by talking about the symptoms, um, the timing of the symptoms, uh, response to fluid, things like that, we can sort out whether it's important or not. Um, and and most of the time, um, in the average Marfan or Lewis disease patient, these these kinds of symptoms um, are not related to the underlying condition. Okay, I'm going to do one more here, um, and you have to explain what this is. Also, can a fixed supracrystal VSD cause aortic root dilation? Um, and this is in regard to um, uh, a young boy does not have a formal diagnosis for Lewis disease, has a variant of unspecified significance for TGF. BR1, and they just want to know if that's a possibility. So what is supracrystal VSD, fixed supracrystal VSD? So a supracrystal VSD is a, well, VSD is a hole between the lower two pumping chambers of the heart. Um, that hole can occur in any portions of the wall, but supracrystal um, occurs right up underneath the pulmonary valve or where the two great arteries 
um, originate or come off of the heart. Um, because of the location of this defect, um, the structure of the aorta and the pulmonary artery um, is sometimes um, weaker or lacking because the defect extends up into the area where the two vessels arise. Um, and therefore, um, some of that um, absence of wall or structure in that area, um, I believe, can cause some weakness or some dilation in the aorta. Now, I have not seen it be, I have a few patients that have this, but I have not seen it be progressive. Um, I have also seen some associated aortic insufficiency as a result of this, but again, I've not seen any progressive aortic dilation. Um, and certainly, if um, there are other you know, features that would suggest a connective, um, an underlying connective tissue disorder, I think that you know, a formal evaluation should be pursued, um, but I do believe that it can be associated with the supercrystal VSD because of the structural um, abnormality that's present. Great. Thank you so much. I'm going to, I have a few final comments. I'd ask you, the three of you to please stay with us here because um, I want to share my slides again. Um, so um, you made a great presentation tonight. I just want to share that if your questions weren't answered, please submit them to markin.org slash e3ask. Um, again, I want to remind you to complete the session survey and I showed you where to do that earlier. Um, we hope that you'll visit the exhibitors in our virtual exhibit hall. Um, they're great supporters of the foundation, so please pay them a visit. Um, we hope you're enjoying connecting with community in the app. It's incredible, all the conversations that are going on, people meeting from all over the world. Um, if you share your information on, about what you've learned and how great what time you're having with us um, on social media, please use our hashtag E3Summit20. And um, if you're enjoying this summit and you'd like to see us do more programming like this, um, we are always open to having your support and you can easily do that at markand.org slash donate. So before we end tonight, I mean, you've really had a, a fantastic presentation. Um, I think Colleen told you all in the chat, but we do have the, the PowerPoint um, in a PDF format, which will be posted tomorrow in the app, um, as well the recording of this if you want to go back over it. Um, and Helene has posted a lot of links um, tonight as well. Uh, so before we go, I just want to, um, some last, some final words. Marcella, we'll start with you. Any final um, words for the parents who are participating tonight? You know, I would, uh, you know, I am a person of optimism. So, you know, I think that we're really very lucky to have this platform for knowledge sharing. I mean, I've learned a lot um, and find great support in other families who are part of this community. Um, and so, you know, I would say, that it's, it's all one day at a time, you know, we know, but we're very, we're very fortunate to have these experts to help us along the way. Great, thank you. Um, Luch, any final words? Yeah, I'm, I'm, well, thank you again for, for inviting me to be a participant in this um, amazing conference. Um, I do think that awareness, um, connection with people is extremely important, learning from others' experiences, and really having um, connection with ex experts um, so that you can make use of, of being able to ask questions and not being afraid to ask questions uh, to, to this group of individuals that this conference has brought together. Um, I, I think it's wonderful to have um, this group and um, this entire organization, uh, both now globally, um, as a resource. And uh, don't be afraid to use it because there are fantastic uh, networking opportunities and fantastic experts at your fingertips. Thank you so much for that. Um, Ron, final word to you. Uh, yeah, so I, I think, you know, knowledge is power. And I think that um, those of you who are not near a Marfan Center might feel that you're sort of detached from the specialists. But, uh, you know, get your local doctor to work with a Marfan Center. Um, or if you have a chance to, to be seen in a Marfan Center, um, if, if you're living in a remote area. Um, but I have patients who um, live in remote areas and they have their local docs and I work with them from Boston. Um, so um, don't feel isolated uh, no matter where you are. Um, um, and connect with other families um, if, that you, if you find that helpful. Um, um, and learn um, and remember that your child is different from everybody else. And so um, work on your child's story. Mm -hmm. great, great advice. And let me just say as a follow-up to 
to all of that. Um, the Marfan Foundation is here to help you guys connect. So I know I've, I've connected some, um, some doctors with Ron, I've connected parents with other parents. Um, and then also obviously with, you know, with Luch, you get, I get it you know, on the text, then you guys are just great to respond all the time and are so willing to work with other doctors around the country. So, um, you know, if you don't, you don't know how to reach somebody, you know, contact the Marfan Foundation and we're all here to help you um, get the best care that you have and the best outcomes for yourselves and your kids. So thank you all so much. Thank you to our speakers for being with us tonight and um, look forward to doing it again soon. Have a great night. Good night. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Thank you.